Okay, Mike McConnell, and the uh, subject here is going to be medical malpractice. We just reached the one-year anniversary, by the way, of the, uh, well, it's been called Obamacare. What's it called? The Affordable Health Care Act, I believe it is. And one of the reasons the Affordable Health Care Act, as we know, had to be there was all the rising costs, which in many cases are associated with, as some would say, medical malpractice insurance, and the doctors are going broke, and no one can afford to be a doctor anymore. Um, I guess would take issue with that stance. Uh, Gibson Vance, he would be president of the American Association for Justice, which is a trial lawyer's organization. And, uh, Mr. Vance, good to have you on the program. How are you? Hey, doing great, Mike. Thank you for having me this morning. You betcha. Uh, Your point would be that medical malpractice actually is nowhere near as expensive for a doctor as the public is led to believe or as doctors would like us to believe. Mike, that's all true. But I guess my key point would be this that we know as a fact that 98,000 people in this country die each year from preventable medical error. Uh, that's a staggering statistic. It's the sixth leading cause of death in our country, and it would be like two jumbo jets crashing every day, an amazing number. Well, it is, but again, you're in, in, in hospitals today. People are there who are close to death anyway. You know, the way I look at it, And I would hate to be misdiagnosed, but the number of times I've taken a car to be fixed and the mechanic misdiagnosed what the problem was and we had to go back again. Now, if he were a doctor and misdiagnosed what the the problem was and my car died, um, that would be an entirely different matter. But I I actually do understand that when you do something a hundred different times, such as diagnose and knock or a ping in a car or diagnose somebody's limp or ache, That something could, in fact, go wrong, and a number of people will die in the course of a year. I'm just one who's more willing to accept that. Well, you know, those uh, statistics speak for themselves. But what you find, uh, Mike, is that only 6% of the doctors are causing 60% of the medical death. So it's really just a few bad actors that we need to get rid of. Uh, But any way you shape it up, we're not talking about people that die from natural causes. We're talking about... 98,000 each year that die from preventable medical error. Well, give me an example of a preventable, a pre- a preventable medical error. Well, I mean, you gave a great one, a mis- misdiagnosis uh, where they uh, make the wrong call. One thing you see tre- uh, tremendous numbers uh, occurring are infections that people get in hospitals. Uh, we talked in terms of doctors, but one of the, the biggest problem are these corporate-run hospitals. People go in for a simple surgery, a simple procedure, get an infection while in a staff infection while in the hospital and never make it out. So that's a major problem. Well, it does happen, but people with the nastiest of infections make it a point to go where? To To the the hospital. hospital. (laughs) And when it comes to the doctors, you say you're talking about the bad apples. I mean, we have doctors out there, a limited number of specialists, who will try certain procedures that other doctors wouldn't dare try. And when things don't pan out because they're trying something new, I would. It seems to me that your organization would label them a bad. Not that there aren't bad apples, but if the guy is labeled a bad apple because he's trying something new, taking a case other doctors wouldn't want to take, I don't label that guy a bad apple. Nor do I, Mike. I think that would come down to informed consent. Uh, if the patient understands that their situation is such a dire situation that a specialist is going to have to try a new procedure. If the patient understands that and they consent to that, then it's not the doctor's fault if they, they do their job correctly and then you just have a bad result. That how would often not do be doctors, Go ahead. How, how often do doctors misdiagnose as compared to lawyers losing cases? Well, that's, that's a fair question. Uh, medical malpractice cases are very difficult uh, to prevail in. Uh, I'll tell you that over the last 10 years, the, the number of malpractice cases being filed has decreased by 15%. So the truth is, the fact is that there are less medical, medical malpractice cases even being filed. What do you think about the whole idea of medical courts? I kind of like that idea. If you have people with a background in medicine and medicine and law, and they make up, uh, let's say, a three- or a five-panel uh, group of judges who would listen to medical cases, I mean, I think it's pretty easy to just, to kind of bamboozle, uh, you know, 12, of, 12 laymen like me. I, I don't want to sit there and listen to, to a lot of what the two attorneys have to say with regard to misdiagnosis and, and the world of medicine. But you get a panel of five doctors up there who know what reasonable, ordinary care would be and those who understand when things can go wrong that are somewhat out of the, uh, 
uh, the capabilities of the average doctor. I, I, I'd like to see them in charge of, medical, of, uh, of any medical lawsuits. How about you? First of all, I think it would be extremely difficult to bamboozle you, Mike. Uh, but I would say this. First of all, we have a Constitution, and that Constitution in the Seventh Amendment provides that we as citizens have a right to a trial by jury. And if you go to a health court, you're taking away that right. Not to mention, in every state, in each 50 states, you're going to have to create a new, new bureaucracy to, and the expense associated with that to establish these health courts. And maybe I'm cynical in this regard, but if I have five or six doctors that may have gone to medical school or play golf with the doctor that's being sued, I don't like my chances. I don't feel comfortable. Well, we could always do it regionally. You know, you can always go across state to somebody who probably hasn't played golf with up to that point in time. I mean, there's even a better possibility that the attorneys played golf with the judge, yes or no? <laughs> I, I, I know of no judge I've ever played golf with. Uh, most lawyers and most judges are too busy to play golf. Uh, but, you know, this is a serious problem. Uh, the, the, the answer is simple, Mike. The way you get rid of medical malpractice lawsuits is you cut down on medical errors. And if we could all concentrate on that, these cases would go away and, and we wouldn't have a problem at all. Well, I would doubt that any doctor intends to commit an error. Um, but, but in any line of work, if I do something 100 times, there's a good chance one out of those 100 times something might go wrong. You do something 100 times, no matter what you do for a living. You know, if you do whatever you do a hundred times, something might not be perfect each and every time. They just happen to be in a line of work where it could cost someone their life or it could cost someone their health, at which time others cash in. Right. You're exactly right, Mike. As a, as a lawyer, uh, I represent individuals. I represent hundreds of individuals over the course of years, and each of those individuals are there because they feel they have a lawsuit. So I know they're, they're not afraid to sue somebody. Uh, do I make mistakes? I'm sure I've made mistakes. Uh, fortunately, the type of mistakes that I can make is not going to cost anybody their life, but I make sure I have insurance. I pay my premiums, and if I do make those mistakes, then the, the person that's injured has a right to recover, and, and that's the way the system works. Um, I, on a different website, not yours, looking at some stats here, they say that uh, the average premium that a doctor pays – only works out to about four. Is it about five percent of his annual income? Yeah, you know, I believe that to be true. I believe that uh, medical malpractice lawsuits have decreased, uh, and then you have states that have enacted caps, uh, artificial caps, to limit what a victim can recover. And it's amazing in those states you see that lawsuits have gone down. You have the caps on the damages, but yet the premiums continue to increase. It's not a pro problem with the victims. It's not a problem with the doctors. It's a problem with the insurance companies. When it comes, there are type, certain types of doctors get sued far more often. I believe OBGYNs get sued far more often than any other specialist. Is that accurate? You, you know, that is accurate. Uh, that is a concern. It's a high-risk area, no doubt. Uh, but by the same token, if they're delivering a baby and that baby in, in, in some of these cases may be injured for life, certainly the family should have a right to compensation. Uh, to some degree. I mean, in some cases, juries haven't, haven't some courts found that a uh, that, that doctor, the OBGYN, can be held responsible for problems that may develop in that child up to age 18? Well, uh, in, in most states, and every state's a little bit different, uh, if a child is injured, uh, they have until they become an adult to file suit or a couple years after they become a, an adult. But I would say this to you, that, Mike, if, if it were my child and, and they were injured in a severe manner at birth, then, you know, I would not wait very long to try to get compensation for that injury. So what... Uh... In what way, will, if any, will you be hamstrung under the uh, the new laws with regard to health care? Well, you know, th there's nothing that I'm aware of under the law that was passed a year ago, but there is a, a law pending in Congress to limit or to place a cap on damages at $250,000. Right. And the problem with that is if you take away the accountability, then these hospitals and, and the bad doctors are not going to have the incentive uh, to try to do a better job and you'll have more medical error. 
Do you really think doctors will stop trying just because they can't be sued for as much money? Well, not the good ones. I mean, the good ones are going to do, uh, you know, be very conscientious every day. But like you said, Mike, in every profession, there are some bad actors. And, and, and look not so much at the doctors. Let's look at the big corporations uh, that run multiple hospitals. Those are the people that I'm more concerned about because if you take away uh, the incentive by capping damages, if you take away that accountability, I guarantee you they're going to put profit over patient safety every time. Am I more likely to come down with a staph infection in a corporate hospital than I am a non for profit? I believe that to be true. Do we know that to be true? I have not looked at the statistics, but I would tell you this, Mike, before you were ever to go into a hospital, each of us needs to look at the statistics on each hospital. All right. Well, listen, Gibson Vance, I'm going to run. I appreciate your insights on all of this, and your web address is justice.org, correct? That is correct, Mike, and I really appreciate you having me on, and have a great day. You betcha. We'll Thank talk you. about it again. We'll Thank talk you. about it again.